Hello and welcome back to the BFI podcast, an audio adventure through the archives of the British Film Institute. I'm Henry Barnes and you're back with us for round two of our two-part special on Martin Scorsese. Last episode we saw Martin Scorsese rise from film school contender to indie cinema champ. By the late 70s, Mean Streets and Taxi Driver had established the filmmaker as one of the new generation of American movie heavyweights. If you were into Hitchcock parodies or pastiches then you liked De Palma. If you wanted a sort of roller coaster ride you probably liked Bill Berg. That's Jeff Andrew, programmer at the BFI South Bank and the curator of the BFI's current Scorsese season. But Scorsese was the one who really seemed to be doing something very fresh and you could feel his cinephilia coming through in his style and indeed in the variety of films he was making. It was wrong to keep harping on about gangsters. He was making films about masculinity, I think. Scorsese, the critic's darling thanks to Taxi Driver, followed it up with the wayward swing of New York, New York, a 40-set musical that bombed. His personal fortunes took a tumble in turn. His cocaine use escalated to the point where, in 1978, after snorting a batch that reacted badly with his asthma medication, he was hospitalised with internal bleeding. Robert De Niro visited him and delivered a last gasp pitch for a story the director had said no to many times before. The story of a once glorious boxing champion based on the life of a middleweight slugger called Jake LaMotta. Raging Bull was about redemption and renewal, about coming off the ropes for one last round with life. This time, something about that story spoke to Scorsese. Never went down, Ray. You never got me down, Ray. You hear me? Never got me down. It was Bob's idea to do it right from the get-go. Marty never really wanted to do it. Bob talked Marty into doing it. That's Raging Bull's writer, Paul Schrader. Here he's explaining that that credit wasn't so clear-cut. So much of the impetus for that film came from the, the actor that when they were on the sets, a lot of things got changed because the driving force mm. was the person who was speaking the language. And uh, so you, don't, you didn't have that kind of censorship of the actor that you normally have when you have a firm text. Mm. Uh, so you know, Bob went all over the place with that script. And the reason that script has never been published is because a lot of it was improvised and there were different versions and things were changed and uh, no one really can agree on what to publish. De Niro threw himself into Raging Bull with a dedication that viewers of Limitless, the intern or Dirty Grandpa, will find unbelievable. He studied LaMotta trained to an international standard as a boxer and when it came to portraying the fighter in his latter, fatter years, chose method over makeup. Raging Bull, you see, took a long time because Bobby had to gain that weight. He really wanted to gain that weight. It was his idea. That's Scorsese himself speaking at the BFI South Bank, then the National Film Theatre, in 1987. We had to shut down, and shut down and pay the entire crew for about four months. until he, So he went through northern Italy and uh, France and ate his way through Cantarelli's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he did. It was, it, was a hard, it was a hard thing. He said, you know, it was really impossible. He said to get up in the morning and force yourself to have breakfast and force yourself to have lunch and force yourself to have dinner. I gained 60 pounds in four months. That's De Niro. I was very uncomfortable with the weight. You know, I couldn't tie my shoes, I couldn't breathe, I, you know. uh, I was tired of eating. I, I thought, well, gee, you know, I can, I can just pig out. But after the first 20 pounds, it's, uh, then, it's, then it's become, it was, well, I, had to, I had to get up early in the morning and eat a full breakfast in order to digest it in time to eat a full lunch, in order to, to digest enough to eat a full dinner and then drink a lot of beer and milk in between, and then it became harder and harder. But we gave ourselves a deadline when we were going to shoot, and at that point, what weight I was, I would be there. There was one quirky perk to the weight gain, though. There were some people who were, were, were uh, turned on by it, oddly enough. <laughs> While De Niro was chomping his way around Northern Europe, Scorsese and his editor, Thelma Shoemaker, got to cutting the boxing bits. Here's Shoemaker, Scorsese's go-to editor for more than 40 years, explaining some of the techniques they used to make the fight scenes sing. He had looked at every boxing movie ever made, and almost all of them the camera was outside of the ring, very rarely in. But he committed to being inside the ring, which was, which was very, very difficult to do complicated camera moves inside a ring with two fighters who have to not only look as if they're being hit, but be aware of the choreography of, of the camera 
Daniel Day-Lewis in Age of Innocence in one of the long Steadicam shots at the end of the day said to the Steadicam operator, it was wonderful dancing with you today. <laughs> that's what it's like when an actor is in a very, very complicated uh, uh, shot like that. They, it, it's really uh, almost balletic and they, they all have to be aware of each other and move certain ways. And um, Both Daniel and Bob were, were wonderful about that. There were certain things they had to do in order to keep the actors from being um, too badly hurt. All the rings were made of velvet instead of canvas because of all the many takes of being punched up against those ropes, their backs would have been just bloody messes. And so um, there were co certain compromises that were made. All of the opponents of Jake LaMotta in the movie are, were actual middleweight contenders. So they were all fighters, which was very, very important. And they had to learn, of course, how to fake getting hit so uh, it, the, the shot is taken hopefully to disguise the fact that the glove is just barely missing the fighter's chin and the fighter has to snap his head at exactly the right moment as that that glove almost uh, hits the chin or receive they, they did receive blows but um, the scenes in which De Niro's head is being punched back and forth and there was no fist in that glove in order to lessen the impact on his brain Shoemaker, who won her first Oscar for editing Raging Bull, has been as vital to Scorsese's success as De Niro, Schrader, or any of his collaborators since. The pair who first worked together on Scorsese's debut, Who's That Knocking at My Door, form a unit, complementing each other. Scorsese's manic energy is given a focus by Shoemaker's steady hand, or, as she puts it, He's caught up in all the agonies of working on the set, the, the clock ticking, you know, the producer's eyes, $10,000 ticking over every second, um, and, uh, you know, actors being sick or the sun going down or a camera breaking and, um, or uh, difficulties with an actor. And um, it can sometimes prejudice, he feels his eyes, so he wants me to look at it coldly, which I do first thing in the day, and um, give him my reactions if I feel something is wrong, which is hardly ever <laughs> the case. In 1984, Shoemaker married the British director Michael Powell, who had been introduced to her by Scorsese. Scorsese, along with British writers like David Thompson and Ian Christie, had used his influence to champion Powell's work bringing the films he had made with Emmerich Pressburger to the attention of a younger audience. Powell, in return, left his mark on Raging Bull. Michael wanted to see where De Niro was training for this fight, for, the, for this film. So they took him down to, he also wanted to see where all the locations for Mean Streets were because Michael just loved Mean Streets. He thought it was a masterpiece. And every time he was walking down the streets of New York, he would sometimes turn to me and say, why isn't Mean Streets playing in this city every day of the year? <laughs> I didn't know how to answer that. but. Uh, so they took him down, first of all, to see where all of Mean Streets had been shot, all the locations. And then they went to see Bob Train, and they were watching videotapes of some of the fights, because Marty was figuring out the choreography for each fight. And um, Michael was looking at it, and he said, you know, there's just something wrong about the red gloves. And Marty said, you're right, the movie should be in black and white. Because he, his memories of fights of Jake LaMotta's era were black and white. Um, and so it was one of those wonderful moments when uh, Michael influenced something Marty did and in some ways was able to repay him for all that Marty had done for him. Raging Bull brought Scorsese back, back, back. It was nominated for eight Oscars, two of which, Shoemakers and De Niro's for Best Actor, it won. Nobody went to see it, but what does that matter? The critics loved it, and Marty, again. Stephen Jenkins, writing in the BFI's magazine, The Monthly Film Journal, said that Raging Bull may prove to be Scorsese's finest achievement to date. Stephen, I think you're still right. Raging Bull exhausted Scorsese, but being Scorsese, he didn't rest. Instead, he grabbed De Niro again for The King of Comedy, a compelling, fractured drama about a fame-obsessed stand-up comedian who kidnaps Jerry Lewis to force his way onto primetime. By this point, Scorsese was starting to feel like a made man, for better and worse. At that time, De Niro and myself, uh, coming back to New York, shooting a picture in New York, um, it was like, well, it was a big time now. And, um, you know, there are five trailers maybe, or four trailers. And then you've got to park them in a certain way. And then Teamsters want this, and the police want that. And then you can't put, put the trailer here. It's Jerry Lewis's trailer. You've got to go back and forth. And finally, if you want to make one move, the entire company has to move. It's like a caravan. Everything has to move. Mm -hmm. Through city streets in the daytime, you can't, you can't function. It's still very hard to shoot films in New York because of that. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we didn't get one break from anybody there. At least I felt that. Um, if we wanted something, we had to pay for it, and we had to pay big. And, you know, as they say, listen, you know, you're getting paid, right? So why shouldn't we get paid? I said, you're right. 
And, uh, but it made it very difficult. It was like making a film with a dinosaur that its, its tail was sort of wagging and slamming everything into the, not, not intentionally, but the tail would just destroy it. It was like one of those Japanese, you know, Godzilla, uh, Godzilla films. Yeah. And everything would just be, you know, just, oh, just look what we did, my God. You know? <laughs> but, uh, well, we'll continue shooting, it's all right. Scorsese's next project offered up more monsters to wrestle. He attempted to adapt The Last Temptation of Christ, a novel by Nikos Kazantzakis that portrayed the Son of God as a man subject to fear, regret, doubt, depression and lust. That's the daily bread for the rest of us. The film would be abandoned, then eventually made several years later. Here's Jeff Andrew explaining why. In adapting a book which tried to explore the human side of the Christ as opposed to the divine side, Scorsese inevitably had to deal with, well, you know, Jesus Christ was a man. How did he feel about, did he have any sexual feelings or romantic feelings for any of the women he met, for example? If you're a very um, conventional Christian, then you might find that blasphemous. Just uh, very unfortunate that it became uh, a political... Symbol. This is Paul Schrader, who did the bulk of the writing work on the adaptation. The controversy surrounding the film was a controversy of cultural hegemony, which is um, who controls the culture. And certain uh, objects or issues from time to time pick up that symbolic weight. It can be flag burning, it can be abortion, you know. But these are issues in which a line is drawn and teams are formed and they fight it out to see who controls uh, the moral level of society. Most of the people who f were fighting about this film had not seen it. Uh, certainly those who were against it hadn't seen it, and many of those who were for it hadn't seen it. It really didn't matter whether they had seen it. They, they were fighting about an issue of who controls the culture, not about a specific film. Uh, whenever the film was actually shown, uh, you know, the invariable result was somewhat uh, disappointment because people were had wanted something very, very incendiary, mm -hmm. which, which the film wasn't. And uh, you know, it's just unfortunate when you get hooked into one of those political symbols because you can run and hide and you just can't get away. The Last Temptation of Christ is one of the few explicitly religious Scorsese films. Kunden, a biopic of the 14th Dalai Lama, and his latest film, Silence, about Portuguese priests loading Christianity upon 16th century Japan, join it at the altar. It's often argued that all of Scorsese's films, hood flicks and religious studies alike, are shot through with the director's abandoned Catholic faith. But Jeff Andrew isn't of that church. I don't really feel too many of his films are actually about religious faith. Um, they may be about other sorts of faith, whether it's a faith in money, if we're talking about The Wolf of Wall Street, or a faith in love, if in Age of Innocence, faith in the medical services in bringing out the dead. But um, I, I don't myself subscribe to the, to the idea that his films are deeply marked by Catholicism and, and, and an interest in religious faith. I think there are a few films, the ones you've mentioned, and obviously Silence is one that is, is very much about that. But I don't feel it that strongly myself. After a zip to comedy for the zany, bizarre after hours, Scorsese delved back into the world of mob demigods. Goodfellas, slick, stylish, brutally violent, told the story of Henry Hill, a real-life tri-state gangster whose association with the Mafia made him an accessory to racketeering, extortion and murder. Played exquisitely by Ray Liotta, Henry is strangely winning for someone who makes his living destroying others. His wife Karen was played by Lorraine Bracco, who would later have a major role in The Sopranos as Tony Soprano's therapist. Here's Lorraine explaining how Scorsese's appetite for perfection could make being in his films hard work. What I did notice, and it used to kind of really make me upset, was that when we were on the set, I would see Marty be me, be, be me, be Karen Hill. And he would place himself and kind of know my lines and do my lines with the other actors when we were rehearsing and putting the camera. And I was like, what? I don't understand why, you know, why he's always me, you know, it made no sense to me. Of course, much later on, 
and watching the movie, um, I think she was the moral compass. And that's what he was doing. But at the time, I was clueless. And um, and maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. You know, I never really talked to Marty about that. But I feel that um, lots of times he he would play Karen Hill. And um, I, it always, I don't know, it made me feel weird. It made me feel bad. It made, it made me mad. <laughs> I was a very young person in film. I didn't really know much about it. He had very specific scenes he wanted to shoot um, that were very, very difficult. Um, and the steady cam shot was very difficult to make come alive and work on, which turned out to be an incredible cinema. And the other scene that uh, was really hard and he had said it was going to be hard to begin with and that was when I'm on top of Ray with the gun. Wake up Henry. Karen. What are you doing? Karen, are you crazy? Yeah, I'm crazy. I'm crazy enough to kill the both of you. Karen, take it easy. Okay? Do you love her? Do you? <laughs> Karen. Karen. The gun is like in the camera, but I could see my reflection. And that was very jarring and difficult. But Marty knew that and kind of warned Ray and I uh, about that. And that was hard. I mean, it's, you know, it's like looking in a mirror trying to act. It was strange. Still, she says, there's no other director like Marty. He is unconditional when you're on the set. You could bring anything to him. Crazy, wacky, uh, good, bad, ugly, uh, whatever. Um, and he is very open to, to wherever you are bringing your character. What comes through his films is his passion, not only for cinema, but actually his passion about the subject in hand. That's Jeff Andrew. You can feel it through the energy of his films. Even even Silence, which is a very, very talky, long, slow film by Scorsese standards. But it's got energy in it, a cinematic energy, which is there in the, the carefulness with which he cho chooses his compositions, the way he moves the camera around, the way he has Thelma Shoemaker cut the film. They're beautifully crafted. So even if some are better than others, you're always going to be caught up in the film while you're watching it. And there, with a contrary panache you'll come to love, promise, is where we're going to leave Scorsese. No 90s, no more noughties, no age of innocence, no silence, no sob, Leo. But you may be able to catch the rest of the story soon enough. Martin Scorsese visited the BFI last week and was filmed in an extended talk with sight and sound editor Nick James by the BBC. That show will be broadcast on March the 4th and we'll have an exclusive run of it on the bfi.org.uk around then too. Our podcast will be back again in two weeks. In the meantime, you can get more information on us and Scorsese at bfi.org.uk forward slash Martin hyphen Scorsese. This episode of the BFI podcast was written, presented and produced by me, Henry Barnes. You can find me on Twitter at Henry H. Barnes. Jeff Andrew was my special guest. He's on at Jeff underscore Andrew. And we were blessed with additional production from the mighty Peter Sale. Find him at Peter Sale or at his website, petersale.co.uk. Our theme music is a track called Throwback Jack, licensed via Audio Network and written by Tim Garland. You can find out more about Tim at timgarland.com. Cheers for listening to us talking to you. Who the hell else will we talk to? We don't see anyone else here. We're back in two weeks. Quick bonus clip here that I couldn't fit in elsewhere. Scorsese had a small acting cameo in Guilty by Suspicion, a drama about the Hollywood blacklist directed by Erwin Winkler, the producer of Raging Bull and Goodfellas. Here's Winkler speaking at the then National Film Theatre in 1991 about Marty's acting.
He was a little nervous, but Scorsese's always nervous. I don't know if he's, he's talked here, I'm sure, and he always jumps around and all that. Anyhow, we got, we got on the set to shoot, and he was a little bit nervous, and you know, he doesn't act a lot. And the last time, he reminded me the last time he acted in, with De Niro was in, in, in Taxi Driver, so that was like 15 years prior. And uh, we did a take, and it was okay. And he turned around after the take, he said, okay, let's move on. <laughs> So I said to myself, I better stop this right now. <laughs> so we didn't move on and we had a jolly time.